Sorry. Probably, yeah. I mean, uh, there is one space, I think, maybe two. Basically, I, I try to uh, make it uh, uh, starting from simple and going a bit into a more complex. Yeah, the GHC interpreter. If you want to do Haskell, because uh, exercises are both in Haskell and Python. Well, I mean, you, you can always uh, come back to it because I provide solutions. Uh, This is really interesting construction. I'm going to move it, I think. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Oi. So, uh, I'd like to start um, with a disclaimer. And so, um, I'm uh, actually a, a middleweight Python programmer. And uh, I'm a Haskell um, novice. So, um, um, what I do for a living, I'm a research programmer. And uh, most of the time, I uh, spend uh, writing code in C++ and uh, prototyping Mathematica. <laughs> So, um, also, uh, uh, I love Python, and I love Haskell. <laughs> so, uh, mm, it's, uh, as Guido mentioned in his keynote, it's like comparing apples and oranges. So, uh, comparison is hard, and it depends on the problem set very much. And uh, uh, it also requires uh, fluency in both languages, uh, which I don't have. So, please, uh, it's, it's a love triangle. and. Uh, both languages are elegant, and uh, um, they are optimized to, to, towards solving different tasks. And uh, they are somewhat related, because Haskell influenced Python a lot through list comprehensions, generators, uh, iter tools. And uh, please don't ask me which one I like more. I think uh, both languages are worth knowing. So uh, first of all, uh, um, um, before I started learning Haskell, uh, uh, I sort of uh, knew that Haskell is slightly harder to learn than Python, and uh, I verified it for myself. So uh, my past, I started learning Python in 2003, and I spoke Fortran and Mathematic at the time. And uh, I found Python uh, difficult at the time, mostly because we needed to write uh, a lot of high-performance stuff, and uh, uh, we ended up writing uh, C extensions and uh, uh, Fortran extensions and interfacing to our Python code uh, through uh, Fortran code through Python uh, using Swig, David Beasley. And uh, I started learning Haskell this year, and uh, I, I now speak C and C++, and uh, uh, I found most difficult another set of things, which was uh, lazy evaluation monads. Um, uh, hard to, com uh, to understand, because these are novel concepts. So, uh, uh, having done all this, uh, I, I think I, I, I agree that Haskell is slightly differ different and uh, more difficult to learn than Python, uh, but this defense depends on your level of ability, so um, it's uh, very subjective. So, um, uh, one of the most important differences, um, just before I start on this, uh, I'm, I'm going to spend uh, 45 minutes highlighting differences uh, between the two languages and uh, similarities, and then we'll do some exercises so you all have uh, opportunity firsthand to perceive the differences. So um, we all know Python is dynamically typed and Haskell is statically typed, and uh, uh, what this means is uh, if you consider this uh, toy 
uh, Python program which defines a function that returns the head of a list. So the uh, first line um, where we pipe into the function uh, list with one element works. The other one fails with uh, fails at runtime with a type error where we have uh, uh, int object uh, has no attribute get item. Whereas in Haskell we have a similarly short program. Um, Firstly, uh, a little bit about the syntax. In Haskell, function application is actually a space operator. So, and functions can contain primes in them because uh, it has some mathematical history. So, uh, but it's a head prime function because actually there is already a head by default imported into the scope. So I, I call it head prime. And it takes a list and uh, it, uh, uh, um, it uh, uses, this is the indexing operator, it takes the first element of the list. And so the first line will work and the second line will fail at compile time with this uh, somewhat more obscure message. But uh, if you spend some time in Haskell, it'll, it'll, uh, it's, it's not actually that bad. So, um, so that's a fundamental difference and uh, uh, it's uh, kind of there in the diametrically different uh, points in the space of languages. Uh, from that perspective. So uh, there is a lot of stuff in between though. So for example, the uh, uh, Haskell boasts this uh, type inference done right. So actually you don't need to write any types in your Haskell program if you don't want to. And as long as there is something for the uh, um, language implementation uh, uh, to grab onto to work out the types, uh, you can actually write uh, your programs without types. So x equals 42, for example, is a valid statement in Haskell and Python. And uh, in Python land, we've got, uh, uh, there are lots of uh, talks about PyPy, and uh, we know that PyPy is implemented uh, using R Python, which is a subset of Python, uh, a more restricted, uh, which was born as an implementation detail of PyPy. And uh, uh, it's, a it's, it's a subset of Python, and uh, um, there are uh, some features are removed, like uh, multiple inheritance. Uh, it's impossible to dynamically change class definitions, and uh, uh, program must be well typed. So, um, so there is, uh, even though they are sitting quite far from each other, there is uh, uh, some stuff bridging the gap. So, the second most important difference is the Python is procedural, uh, functional, and object-oriented, uh, multi-paradigm, if you will, language whereas Haskell is pure, functional, and lazy. And uh, I'll tell in a second what that means. So uh, when I was writing this slide, I thought this is a little like Henry Ford's Model T, uh, where he uh, said uh, at some point that uh, customers can have any color they want as long as it's black. So even though Haskell and Python actually support various uh, styles, for example, many Haskell programmers uh, stated that Haskell is a favorite uh, imperative language. And you can program in functional style um, um, in Python. It's more like you can program in any style as long as it's functional in Haskell and in Python it's mostly imperative and object-oriented. So uh, lazy evaluation, this was the most daunting concept for me. And it's actually uh, call by name plus sharing. And uh, in Haskell, um, uh, computation is application functions to arguments. And so uh, the order of evaluation of expressions is not important, but it, has some, it ha affects how you get the result. And so you can have the uh, uh, innermost evaluation order or outermost evaluation order. And uh, uh, functions can be strictly lazy, and this has some implications on whether arguments are passed by value or by name. So consider the following uh, Haskell expression. Um, uh, at the top, you have a type signature for this function. It takes a tuple of two arguments, x and y, and multiplies them. And uh, we specify the, the arguments of type int, and the arrow means uh, it returns uh, the uh, uh, single int. So if I use this function uh, by um, piping into it two expressions, one plus two and two plus three. If we use the innermost uh, method of evaluation, first we evaluate the arguments and then we invoke the function. So uh, um, this uh, uh, eventually gets us to the result 15. Whereas we, if we use outermost, first the references to these expressions are passed into the uh, mold function 
And then uh, once there is nothing else left to expand, we actually resort to computing. Uh, it's, it seems like there is not very much difference, but actually uh, there are some fundamental differences. And uh, um, there was this debate, what is better by name or by value? And uh, by name in, uh, is better in some ways. Uh, namely, uh, column by name uh, ensures that evaluation terminates as soon as possible. By the way, I didn't ask, can, should, should I stand, should I sit? Because uh, I don't mind. Can you see me well from the back? So uh, this expression, which uh, uh, is a recursively defined uh, infinity, uh, um, is of type int, so it will eventually return an int. But uh, uh, inf is defined as 1 plus the invocation of inf again. So this expression, if you use the uh, uh, by name argument passing strategy, it will, uh, or by uh, value, it will not terminate at all. But the one below, where the f uh, FST is the first uh, function, it uh, basically takes a tuple and returns first uh, entity in that tuple. So uh, even though if we try to evaluate fully the, this, we will never terminate, since you can do, uh, you can pass a reference to a tuple, and first, uh, first cares only about the zero here. It'll return zero, and uh, it, although it's an infinite expression, it'll be, uh, it'll terminate. On the other hand, by value is better, because if, if you actually see some uh, uh, simple examples uh, of it at work, you'll see that sometimes, uh, like this one, I defined a square function, and I passed one plus two to it first gets expanded, and uh, we're essentially doubling the work here, because then we will have to evaluate every constituent twice here. And uh, this is, uh, we are doing extra work. So uh, Haskellers, they uh, really like uh, early termination uh, on infinite expressions. So they chose by name strategy with sharing. Uh, and sharing is uh, this trick where instead of passing the expression themselves, you pass promises for these expressions. And then once uh, the expression, expression is actually needed, uh, you evaluate it and you remember the result of evaluation. So it's uh, a pictorial representation is you pass P, uh, just a second, you pass P and uh, uh, P and then the f once, once star, by the way, is a strict um, uh, function. So uh, uh, you can only uh, um, um, compute its result um, by computing um, the arguments first. Um, so uh, at this point, there is nothing left to do but evaluate P. So you evaluate P, and then P is already available, and uh, that's lazy evaluation. Sorry, there was a question. All right. Uh, so this is uh, this is kind of a, a uh, in Haskell. It's only by um, reference plus sharing. There is no by value. It's, uh, it's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to describe the difference, but Haskell chose lazy evaluation, which is by name plus sharing. So it's, it's, it's a, uh, so if, if someone asks you what lazy evaluation in Haskell is, it's called by name plus sharing. That's all there is. So uh, what is purely functional then? Uh, purely functional is uh, basically a uh, a special uh, way that you choose to program. Yeah, please. Can you yeah. Again, explain what the sharing means. So sharing is if you consider squ square yeah. invoked with one plus two. Yeah. So if th if this was a call by name without sharing, yeah. what we do we we pass uh, the expression was pl one plus two to the function square, so and then we twice, yeah. then once there is nothing left to evaluate here, we have to evaluate this and then this. So we are doing more work yeah. than we could have. So instead, what they do, they pass a promise uh, for evaluation one plus two. And then this, uh, whenever, when we got to this expression, we evaluate the first one, and then we remember it. Uh, so yeah, exactly. So it's, it's a trick. But uh, you get the best of both worlds. You get uh, expressions that can potentially never terminate, that are usable, and also you get uh, speed. So yeah, please. Star, so strict. So um, all everything you define in Haskell is, is actually lazy by default, except in certain c 
corner cases. And uh, so, for example, uh, pattern matching is strict by default unless you, um, you uh, instruct otherwise. And also, uh, all the built-in uh, arithmetic functions are strict because uh, uh, it's more efficient um, to work this way. So, um, so second thing is uh, purely functional. So um, uh, it's basically it's a, a restriction. Uh, you choose to work with data structures that uh, exclude destructive modifications or, or updates. So this has a lot of benefits uh, in uh, um, uh, programming. For example, you get referential transparency, uh, which means uh, uh, things do not affect each other. So compiler has more opportunities for optimization uh, for parallelization purposes. And uh, uh, it's also more amenable to analysis. So compiler can do more uh, with what you give it. So um, I'd like to highlight what's the difference between persistent data structures and ephemeral data structures. So persistent data structures, they support multiple versions. So suppose you have a tree and you inject a value onto it. So uh, if it's a persistent data structure, the old tree, the uh, unmodified tree is still available. Whereas uh, in ephemeral one, which is uh, mostly what we use in the uh, imperative world, uh, once we put something on a stack, say, the old stack is no longer available. Uh, you, you have only the reference to new modified stack. So uh, in this slide here, Haskell works only with data structures that uh, um, once you've modified them, the old version is still available. And that's what the purely functional means. So why do we uh, even want to go functional? Uh, I already mentioned some of the uh, benefits, uh, but I, I'm going to mention them again because <laughs> they're very important. So there are methodological benefits because it's easier to reason about your code. And uh, there are persistence benefits because uh, um, if you've modified your data structure, your old data structure is still available. And the uh, uh, compiler has more information. So why are we not programming functionally at, uh, as much as uh, 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 we should? So functional data structures are actually more difficult to design. And uh, um, in some cases, uh, some theoretical computer scientists, uh, I have a reference if anyone is interested, agree that it's fundamentally, uh, uh, the, the uh, functional uh, data structures are fundamentally uh, less effective than imperative. And uh, uh, that's basically, you have to live with it. So why functional data structures are so hard to write and use? Well, it's because uh, I like uh, how Chris Sakasaki put it. It's incredible handicap, staggering handicap. And uh, uh, his quote, like knives, destructive updates can be dangerous when misused, but tremendously effective when used properly. So there you go. You lose something, you gain something. And uh, what you lose is safety, and uh, uh, you get this tremendous effectiveness. So also, uh, functional data structures are judged more harshly. So for example, the, uh, uh, for some reason, functional data structures are expected to be more flexible. So if we have imperative update, you expect only the new data structure to exist after the update has completed. Whereas when you have a functional update, you already have old and new. So it's sort of you gain more. But also, uh, functional data structures uh, um, um, are automatically persistent, whereas imperative are typically ephemeral. And imperative programmers are uh, not surprised when, if they want the old data structure uh, to be available, they have to write more code. But in functional land, you get it uh, uh, by default. So uh, that's uh, an interesting point that Chris made. So um, I'd like to illustrate some of these things on uh, really short programs. So this is the ease palindrome function. They takes a list, uh, it reverses it, and then uh, checks if it's the same. And if it returns true if the list is a palindrome and uh, false otherwise. So every Haskell program has to have a main function, and uh, that's how you print a result to the screen. So the uh, similar implementation in Python is that uh, you take a shallow copy of L and then you reverse it and then you test for equality and uh, you print the result to the screen. Sorry? 
Yeah, uh, I, I went for, uh, please, uh, uh, I should have said that I did not optimize for the length of code on those slides unless it didn't fit on the slide. So here, I, I just wrote, I know uh, both of these can be one-liners, but for clarity, uh, I just uh, uh, chose. So um, I'd like to speak first, because uh, in Python, dictionaries and lists are sort of pillars on which we stand. And uh, lists are very important, but lists in Python and in Haskell are very different from each other. And uh, in particular, in Haskell, lists are actually represented as, uh, in, internally as singly linked uh, lists. So what you get, you get uh, uh, an element and a pointer to the next element in the list and so on. Uh, and it's an efficient data structure for stack-like or stream-like access patterns. Also, very uh, importantly, it's a homogeneous data structure, so you can't have lists that, uh, uh, whose elements are uh, of different type, whereas in Python you can. And, uh, sorry? Yes, of course, there are other, but it's just the, there is a confusion between lists in Python and lists in Haskell. I just wanted to say they're very different beasts. And so, um, access, insertion, and update at position i of length n in Haskell actually is a, uh, can be a costly operation depending on how you do it. It uh, costs uh, uh, in O notation, big O notation, it's O O i, where i is the position of the element in this list. Whereas in Python, do you know, does anyone know how Python uh, lists are implemented? Arrays. Yeah, okay, so uh, uh, they are arrays, in fact. And uh, um, what's the cost of insertion into Python lists? Order n. Oh, you're answering no question. <laughs> Sorry. Order n. So uh, insertion actually is a costly operation. And uh, access and update are free. So uh, this means that uh, the following uh, is very expensive, growing beyond the current allocation size. Because it's an array, you have to reallocate an array. An array. Yeah. It's a linear data structure right. where it's continuous in memory so that uh, you get uh, uh, a random indexing into it free. Okay, so it's a series of pointers or something? No, it's not. It's, it's, it's uh, a continuous chunk in memory. Uh -huh. so, uh, so you get update and access for free, but insertion... Uh, sorry? Yeah? Uh, actually, if you append to the end of the list, the, the insertion is uh, all the one I'm of five. Not all the one, all the one. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so, but uh, asymptotic complexity uh, averaged over all access patterns is order of n. Yeah. I believe uh, from the, uh, uh, I, this information comes from the uh, computational complexity of lists and dictionaries page on Python website, so amortized insertion in Python over n. We, we could discuss it if you want, but. Mm. Yeah, but amortized is uh, amortized over a certain chunk uh, of operations, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. But this is this is referred to all over n operations. So, um, so and the second thing is that insertion or deletion of an element um, in the beginning of an array is uh, is expensive. So, um, so. The, um, Two hello worlds in Python and Haskell, and uh, you all know how to run Python programs. Uh, to run a Haskell program, you uh, uh, can choose to compile it, which can be done like so, or you can choose to run it without compilation uh, by typing run Haskell space and then program name, and then that's how you invoke it. So let's let's see how expensive uh, prepending and appending is in uh, Haskell. And uh, it's, it, this is an example program in Haskell that what it does, it's uh, uh, insert many function that takes two parameters, uh, an integer and a list. And uh, if uh, uh, this is button matching of Haskell at work, uh, the function is actually defined on two lines. And uh, the first line is invoked only if the first argument is zero. So what you get uh, uh, if the first argument is zero, you reverse list and return. Whereas if it's not zero, you bind the first argument to n and second to list. And then 
you recursively invoke insert many, again, decrementing the first argument and prepending. Uh, colon operator is uh, prepending to a list operator in Haskell, prepending uh, that number to the list that you've passed in. So this, what, what this will do, this will grow Haskell list in the most efficient way, uh, putting elements at the beginning of the list all the time. And until it reaches the end, which is when the first argument will be zero, in which case it reverses it and uh, returns the result. And I keep all of these in memory for the time being, so I want the whole array to live in RAM, and uh, then I invoke a sum on it, and I print the results. So this, this took no time at all on uh, my laptop here, which is a slow laptop. So appending uh, will be realized, so the, the only difference here is that I don't reverse the list in the first uh, function, and uh, I, instead of prepending, I append. Uh, um, the double plus operator in Haskell is a concatenation of two lists. So you can see the, the difference is staggering. Uh, it takes three seconds now instead of no time at all. So in Python, the same thing. You can see uh, prepending uh, is very expensive, whereas appending takes no time at all. So summary of lists. Uh, Python lists are arrays underneath. Haskell lists are lists. And lists require more RAM than arrays. Lists are more sensitive to access patterns. And uh, more importantly, uh, Operations like lengths, for example, or last element, they are order of n operations in Haskell, whereas uh, in uh, um, Python they are constant time operations. Why are you reversing that list in the, in the pre-pending? I, I, just, I just wanted the list in memory yeah. to uh, uh, will, um, contain elements in, in ascending order. That's, ascending. Yeah, that's, that's what I wanted. Um, so, um, Second benchmark, I just tried to see how much RAM this uses and uh, worked out that uh, um, it bombs on my machine with 10 to the power 8 values. And uh, with Python, I was able to go further um, because uh, it used less RAM. And then I've done another benchmark where I've decided to, instead of invoking some function in Haskell, I did a left fold um, with a plus operator on a list. And uh, I think that's how some function is implemented, so it actually runs the same speed. Whereas uh, in Python, I tried the same pattern where I've imported the uh, operator and uh, piped it to reduce and uh, reduce the list this way. And uh, this was actually a little slower than this version, so, but uh, insignificantly. So, so then uh, what I did, I've uh, done those two versions where I went to uh, the case where I don't store all, the, all these elements in memory. So um, this, this list is lazy in Haskell. So um, fold, therefore, will be lazy. And actually, you will never see this list in RAM. And I did the same for, you don't actually need to use X here with new Python. But all, all ranges were not iterators in Python. But n now they are. So, um, so I actually was able to compute a lot more. And this is the time it took. So Haskell and Python here are very comparable. So, uh, by the way, I'm benchmarking here. All the benchmarks are for a particular implementation of Haskell and Python. Uh, so I use GHC, which stands for Glasgow Haskell Compiler, uh, and CPython and PyPy, where the reference implementations of Python. So um, then I, I'd like to make a detour and uh, discuss fate of reduce. So uh, Guido wrote in his blog that 12 years ago, reduce filter and map uh, were added as courtesy of uh, Liz Packer who missed them and submitted working patches. But despite the EPR value, I think uh, those features should be cut from Python 3000. And then uh, it was updated to say that Lambda filter map will stay, but reduce will be moved to uh, func tools. So why drop filter and map in Python? Well, uh, uh, readability considerations mostly. Uh, filter PES reads better as uh, list comprehension, now that we have them x for x in s, if px. And the same is true for map. And if you do that, uh, you'll notice that most common predicates are actually comparisons. So you can use them in place. And uh, this means no need for lambdas, uh, anonymous functions. And uh, also that lambdas are uh, harder to read uh, for someone um, who didn't write the code. And uh, uh, also lambda, lambdas are slower than least comprehensions. So why drop lambda? 
Well, first, the name is confusing uh, because those who didn't come from the background of um, computer science and don't know what lambda calculus is is kind of uh, um, the first question, really, about lambdas. And also, uh, everything you can do with lambdas, you can do also with uh, uh, in, uh, nested function definitions. And uh, uh, once map, filter, and reduce are gone, there aren't any very many places you really need to write very short local functions. So it's, again, clarity and uh, duplication removal. Why drop reduce? Again, clarity, the applicability of reduce is limited to associative operators mostly, and uh, in all other cases, it's, it's better to write a loop so that the uh, reader of the code is uh, uh, more able to understand what's going on. So uh, Guido mentioned that actually you need to write a tree if the reduce operation uh, uses complex function to actually see what's going on, whereas if it is in a loop, it's much, much easier to comprehend. And then I've done a, 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 I tried to get these benchmarks to run as fast as I could. So what I noticed actually that Haskell was using integers uh, that are infinite. Uh, and uh, if I chose to run in, in 64 mode, it actually took one second to do the 10 to the power of 8 uh, sum. And in Python, uh, I decided to run PyPy. And, uh, uh, a, by the way, stands for benchmarks done on my desktop, not on my laptop. My desktop is uh, qu quite a bit faster, and you can see very comparable performance by Pi and GHC. And uh, on my laptop, it was a little slower, and uh, PyPy did not perform as well. Um, then I've done... Okay, sorry, uh, I removed the test. So, that's on list benchmarks, uh, Python and Haskell. And uh, I'd like to discuss now eager programming in lazy Haskell, because uh, we know the Haskell is lazy by default. But actually, sometimes uh, it's too lazy, and uh, it puts a lot of stuff on the stack. And uh, uh, you can uh, have a stack overflow. So uh, they have this special syntax. Uh, I already told you that uh, function application is space, but dollar uh, or dollar ping is also function application. But in strict way. What does this mean? That before you can actually pipe x to f, please evaluate x fully and then uh, invoke f. So uh, GHC is very clever these days. It actually can run strict strictness analysis at uh, compile time. And if it sees something that could be um, more memory efficient um, um, by implementing um, strict uh, versus lazy, it'll, it'll switch to strict mode. And uh, um, I will not mention the last two lines. Say again, what kind of line? What does it mean? The dollar playing operator? Yeah. It's the function application operator, but it's a strict function application operator. Because if you. F is a function, right? Yes. And x is the, its only argument. Okay. So if you write f of x. So don't say just don't lazy do yeah, so if you do f space x it will be a lazy evaluation, whereas f will be invoked, and then x will be, instead of the actual argument, the promise for that argument will be passed into f. Whereas if you write f uh, dollar playing x, it will be a strict. Uh, so this actually is source of a lot of confusion. If you look up Neil Mitchell, you'll see some very interesting stuff that he dug up in uh, other people's code in Haskell. And uh, uh, this is just uh, amazing. Uh, somebody anonymous written a, a blog post. I like to read it. The source of all this confusion is uh, second uh, dollar playing. Are in fact lazy about being strict, and whenever they use, they create a thunk that, like anything else, is just uh, uh, that when someone pulls on that thunk, the sick will pull on something else first before giving the answer. So for folks who find reasoning about laziness difficult, lazy strictness is doubly <laughs> hard to grasp, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, a more authoritative uh, statement about this is uh, by Graham Hutton, who said that um, uh, even for relatively simple examples, the use of strict application is a specialist topic that requires careful consideration of the behavior of lazy evaluation. So it's, it's kind of a dark area of Haskell. So you can also do lazy programming in eager Python, and uh, we can achieve this by using iterators, generators, and uh, generator expressions. Uh, and there is very useful iter tools module, which I'm sure you all heard about. So iterators is an object representing a, a stream of data, and it feeds one element at a time. And you can invoke .next method on it, and it will return one element. 
and uh, when the iterator is exhausted, the uh, stop iteration exception is raised, and you can uh, some objects can be converted into iterators uh, by using iter function. Uh, so these are some examples. You can use iterators with min max functions. You can uh, use them with membership operators. You can uh, unpack them, like in this line here, and uh, you can convert them to tuples and lists. And uh, uh, with iterators, you can only go forward. Uh, and no way to reset a copy iterator. Generators, uh, they allow to declare a function that behaves like iterator, and uh, this useful uh, way of simplifying the task of um, writing iterators, and uh, it uh, makes it possible in Python to write uh, different patterns. For example, you can replace callback pattern with iteration. And uh, Raymond Hettinger do done a lot of work of, on generator expressions, in particular, uh, so generator expressions, uh, they are memory-efficient list comprehensions, and uh, they use syntax of uh, list comprehensions, but semantic of creation of anonymous generator, and then uh, generate a function, and then calling it. Here's an example of a generator and a generator expression. Uh, these two functions uh, do essentially the same thing. Uh, the first one, uh, I'm told, is slightly faster, but uh, performance-wise, uh, they are pretty much the same. So, uh, really, uh, the decision whether to use generator or generator expression is really down to readability. So, if something reads better as a generator expression, use generator expression. Ether tools is uh, a module packed with uh, lots of good stuff. So, we've got uh, simple iterators like cycle, count, and repeat that infinitely produce infinite sequences. We've got uh, some combinatoric iterators, product combinations, permutations, and a flavor uh, combination with replacement. So there are other iterators as well. You can combine, you can chain, daisy chain the uh, iterators. You can uh, uh, copy them. You can, uh, this uh, analog of map thread in Mathematica, where you can uh, um, use IMAP, and there are many others, so please go to the Python documentation and see what, what else is out there. So, um, at this point, uh, I'd like to start with some uh, uh, exercises. So, um, the way it's going to be done, uh, I'll provide files that contain some assertions that uh, uh, we will strive to satisfy, and they'll look like this. It's an assertion. Uh, we need to define compress function, and the function um, accepts a list that potentially contains some duplicates, and I want the compressed version. Um, so, I import uh, at the top of this file uh, from it to this group by function, and uh, um, I invoke group by function on L, and then uh, I unpack the result into key and group um, iteratively, and then I only use key. So, that's the example problem and example solution. So, uh, does everyone have an internet connectivity here? Or, uh, I have um, two USB sticks with, uh, so those who don't, please uh, come and grab a USB stick that contains problems and solutions for this course. And uh, um, please don't look at the uh, solutions too early. Uh, uh, be nice. And uh, uh, for those who have internet access, I've provided here a Yes, the files are online. I'm typing the URL right now. So, uh, so that's the URL. If you go to that URL, you'll see two folders. For the moment, just look at the contents of problems. Everyone got that? Cool. So, so what, what I'd like to do next is to write, sorry, the URL again. Success. So what I'd like uh, to do next is uh, to write the same, fun the same function, compress but without using group by. And uh, I think there is a file 
uh, called uh, duplicates removal dot pi problem in problems directory. So if you if you open that file. Yes, correct. So it's it's called 99 under 08 under duplicates problem dot py. Uh, yeah, solutions are in a different directory, so please do not look at solutions yet. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, if you want to, I mean, there are there are Python interpreters running in the browser, so if if you feel like, I mean, use whatever tool you prefer. Yeah, you can uh, download the whole directory, or you can uh, copy the files from USB stick. Yeah, I think there's somewhere around. So, if when, once people are done, uh, just raise your hand, and I'll pass it around. Mm. Okay. Well. Uh, Oh, the, the spacing thing. Um, remember I said I wanted to keep it on the slide without reducing the font. So, um, so by the way, don't copy the style. The style is that uh, uh, function names and uh, variable names are uh, short, so, I, so you can see it on the slide. But uh, use your preferred style of sp uh, spacing. Also, maybe you can copy it on the site as well, somewhere, uh, from the USB stick, so if, if it's available locally. Oh, I, don't, I think uh, over time they'll all copy the stuff. So I'm just going to think. Yeah? As a reminder, please repeat the question because it's training only here what you say. Okay, sure. No problem. Yeah, I will do that from now on. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's the plan. Yeah. Is, is there any way to download the whole folder? That's not how do you remember which link is it? Because it, it, it assumes I'm Italian. Well, I, probably by IP. I'm not good sure. question. I don't I'm know. Not sure where to switch language. <laughs> well, yeah. Cause it seems to have a, a link to download the whole folder. Yeah. Uh, can you download just one file? Because yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Which other side? Oh, excellent. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cool. I'll try that. Well, just uh, don't care about performance for now. Just write what would feel natural to you. Just the current one. Uh, it, it will be like five minutes. You have to do this. So, yeah, it's. It, pardon? Yeah, yeah. So it depends. I, I don't know what the level of ability is. So once you're all done, if if you can, you know, cheer me up, and I'll I'll continue. So I think at the moment they also copy the exercises. So we need to give a bit time. It's an easy tool, yeah.
Yeah, sure. That's a good point. Yeah, it's, it'll be a list of lists, uh, and uh, each list would contain only elements that uh, uh, are equal. Hmm. Well, in that case, uh, it'll be a. Uh, 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 I think it's it would be a key and a group, so it will be a tuple, perhaps. Uh, the first element will be the key, and the second element will be the uh, the whole group. Yeah. So and then uh, I discard the group, as you can see, and I keep the key. Yeah. Oh, it, if you if you don't understand, Python is really good at introspection, right? Right. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, that's a good point. Just a sec. I can't really see what I'm doing here. So, so that it's it's a tuple uh, containing a. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. The, but the, I, I couldn't. If I sure. Hold on. Yeah, this is the same result. Yeah, hmm. but Sure. Sure. So, but uh, you can poke it this way. Basically, this is the answer. I see what it's doing. It's just that the documentation doesn't make sure it's it. Cool. So, uh, how many people have copied the files on the computer? Say I <laughs> or raise hand. Yeah, the solutions and problems, but don't look at uh, all the problems and don't look at solutions yet, please. So, um, the solution I came up with, can I show it on the screen now? And uh, um, so, I, I use the uh, a generator here, and uh, um, I used uh, an auxiliary function that converts the result of evaluating compressed gen on L to a list and then returns that, so it satisfies the assertions. And uh, the meat of this function is if L is not empty, yield the first element and then iterate through the elements, uh, comparing the current element to the previous element, and if they are different, yield one. So uh, I hope uh, all you came up with something similar. But Jim, uh, um, hmm? well, this because uh, you, you, you can use uh, compressed gen on because uh, uh, it's it's an iterator, right? So it's more memory efficient, and um, it might be more CPU efficient as well if you don't use the whole sequence, right? Then yeah, sure, but that. The, the, the auxiliary function is just to satisfy the tests below, because uh, the, uh, the assertions contain lists. And yeah, so, uh, but you can use compressed gen on its own. So the, the second uh, task is uh, please don't use for statement in your solution for those who uh, used it. And uh, how many people did not use a for statement? I, I see one hand, so yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, no iteration 
of any kind. No, th this is a previous solution. The next one, uh, please. No I iteration. Yeah, so is there another question? No duplicates? Or uh, the, no the, the test that you need to satisfy is the same. It's this one. So you just uh, comment out or discard your previous solution and uh, work with it uh, trying to satisfy the test, but with a function that does not contain any, any iteration. Yeah? Oh, well, uh, I don't have any uh, predispositions as to what you call your function as long as it's called compress. And uh, uh, whatever other functions you create to satisfy the test, I don't care. Well, at the moment, there are two solutions on the screen, this one and that one, and they both satisfy the test. So, but I want a third one. The first one used a library function, group by, so you didn't actually need to do any work. You just used the library function. The second one used the generator. And the third one, I want a solution that does not iterate using for or while or whatever. Um, recursive, recursive, yeah, you can try and, uh, and uh, accomplish it through recursion, if you feel like. I don't know. I'm a middleweight Python programmer. You tell me. Yeah, it's got four in it. Sorry? This is uh, 2.7. Sorry, uh, ranges. Not as uh, of Python 2.7. I see. Well, that's yeah. Okay, so you're right. So um, <laughs> if I wanted a memory efficient I version, fine, yeah. Yeah, good point. So, for the like lightweight Python programmers, can you explain the yield keyword? Um, yield is like return, but from a generator. Okay. So what happens? It returns uh, whatever is passed into it, and then when the next item. Uh, is requested yep. by invoking dot next. Yep. Uh, it will resume execution of this function from that point. Okay. So it's, it's like return from a function okay. with. So the first one happens once, and then in the in the loop, it's going to sort of pass. Happen many back times. Back yeah. Until we call next. Hmm. Pardon? The the what? The test. Oh, you, you've got it. On, it should be. Uh, it should be on your, on the USB stick. Or online. So you, you should all have the tests now. If you if you want to, it's uh, basically uh, my desire is to see what what feels na natural to you as a Python programmer. So uh, it just uh, it's a cons constraints are the tests uh, in the form of assertions and the the, uh, the verbal constraint. Uh, Uh, maybe. 
No, can, can you restate that if anyone got that? If anyone needs a USB stick again, it's here. So, oh. kitchen? No. Well, sorry, <laughs> got it. Another USB stick is available. Anyone wants it? Anyone? Okay, so I think we're all done. Uh, it's uh, 1000 uh, recursive. It's, it's, I think you can, if you import sys, you can print, um, get, get uh, recursion limit, or whatever. Uh, dot get recursion limit. Uh, it's, yeah. Yeah, one thousand. Okay. Function, yeah. So cool. Good point. Yeah. My uh, Python knowledge comes from 2002, <laughs> so I don't no, stay up to date. Cool. So, so this is the preferred way now. Yes. Okay. It, it has always been because if you add it this way, and if I now add a message here, yeah. then it's the same as this. So I'm just asserting the tuple, and the tuple is always true. Okay, I see. So it has to be without the parentheses like this. Yeah, I, I never use this because it just tells me the line on which it failed and then I could read the code. All right, so uh, a few people start looking uh, available again. So um, shall we? Uh, this is a solution that I came up with, uh, which uh, uh, does indeed involve a recursive call. So. Uh, the compressed function now does a little bit more work. If uh, L is empty, it returns empty list. Otherwise, it uh, uh, invokes compress implementation function. Pipe in the first element as the first argument and the rest, the tail of that list, as the second argument. And then compress implementation takes two lists and it sort of it consumes the, the first list, checking for equality with the, uh, car, um, with the tail of the uh, list that it produces, this stem. And then it returns a uh, uh, call to itself. So, um, yeah. So, um, I like that. To, I'd like to talk li a little bit about this. So, this is actually an example of a tail recursion, and uh, Python does not uh, see Python does not optimize tail recursion very well. So, if if you work on large lists, you are bound to run into uh, um, uh, maximum recursion depths uh, exceeded. Um, but if uh, if you keep um, the problem set to small one, this is a, a, a possibility. And uh, um, yeah, yes. So uh, re absolutely. But what what? Sure. But uh, um, it's still bound. 
right? So uh, there is an upper bound in it, and it will all go on the stack. And uh, um, um, there is a guard against stack overflows in Python. I'm, I'm sure many of you know, and uh, it's by default a thousand. But you can you can check it by importing this module, and uh, you can set it to whatever you want. So um, the equivalent solution to this in Haskell, which I'll just show on the screen, is uh, uh, um, this is how we'll, well, those tests will look like in uh, Haskell world, and uh, you have the problems and solutions solved in Haskell as well, so you can you can play around with them later if you want. So uh, it's essentially the same uh, set of assertions. Uh, I had to import test each unit to uh, get access to assert, and uh, uh, that's the solution using uh, similar to group by in Python function available from data list module uh, in Haskell. So if you ignore type signature, I uh, have written type signatures, uh, but if you ignore it for now, the function uh, works as, as so. It uh, checks if L is empty by calling null. So if L is null, then it returns an empty list. Otherwise, what it does, it uh, calls group uh, function with uh, list as a first argument. Um, then uh, it maps the result of that. Um, so the result of group in Haskell is it takes a list of uh, load of elements, and then uh, it returns a list of lists where inside each sublist uh, there are elements of on that are equal. And then, and then what you can do, you can map this with a function called head, and this will, uh, as we've seen, it just returns one of them for reference. So dot in Haskell is the uh, function composition operator. So uh, it's, uh, you can, can you give me a pen? Ah, there you go. So it, it'll f dot g. Ah, I, I, could, I could type on my computer. So uh, f. So in, in Python, fg of x, in Haskell, fg uh, um, dollar x. So this will create a function that will act like a function that takes the result of g and pipes it into f. Yeah? There is one question. Well, because the head, uh, um, pardon? Yeah, possibly. Um, I need to double check that. Um, so um, while you do the next exercise, I'll uh, repeat the question and answer it. OK. Um, so um, the dollar sign you can you can do the, you, you can use parentheses you can group this expression and then this will be a function to which l is piped in but the problem is a function sign Haskell uh, are the utmost because uh, kind of it's the most important thing in Haskell so uh, space operator which is a function application operator it has the highest priority but sometimes you can so these two expressions are equivalent. So dollar is uh, space. And uh, uh, if you write uh, expressions like f of uh, x of y, this will be interpreted as f uh, um, is passed in two arguments to it. So, but if you do something like, because um, space operator is left associative by default. So that's how, how this, is, this expression is parsed. But if you do something like f um, dollar x y, then x is actually a function of one argument, and the result of this function is piped into f. So it's 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 a um, so yeah. In this example, this one. Uh, yeah, this one. No, uh, this, this one. one. Yeah. If you erase the dot and put the dollar sign in, in, in the place of dot, it would be the same, right? Um, what will happen then? If you, if you just erase the dot and put dollar sign there. So this expression f, f dollar g x g will be the same as f dot g dollar x. 
Well, not quite, because uh, right now we've got two functional application operators, space and dollar, and space takes priority, so it will be parsed like this. Yes. And, and then pass it to F. Right? Yeah, exactly. So F. The dot is a function composition operator. It says that takes the result of G and pipe it into F, and you can call it a new function uh, L. So you can write things like that without parentheses and uh, without the argument, the actual argument. Right, so I think we are getting diverted uh, a little bit. So. Um, with only parentheses. So, uh, just a second. Uh, what was the number of this exercise? Uh, uh, solution. So that is, so you, you, you could write this statement as so. You could say, um, uh, I'm going to be editing it in place so it's clear. So you could say where then groups equals group L. And then you could say this. Not anymore, because map, map, map. Map is a function of two arguments. It takes uh, the function to apply to each element. Yeah. Why do I get this error? Because this should be equivalent. So add group. Uh, well, because what you're doing, your uh, uh, map already satisfied all its argument. Uh, so what, what about this? Thing? Yeah. Yeah. It's the same. So uh, moving on. Uh, this is the solution without group in Haskell, so there is some new syntax here. Uh, Haskell uh, is very, has a very powerful feature called uh, um, uh, pattern matching. So what you see here is, uh, um, again, the function is defined as two functions, and uh, patterns are matched top to bottom. So if the pattern is not satisfied here, it moves to the next definition of the function. And if uh, uh, it's a non-exhaustive set of patterns, uh, it will produce an error message at compile time. So the single argument, uh, which is a list, uh, at the moment it is tested, it has to be a list that contains at least um, um, two, um, c uh, two elements in it. So the first element will be bound to the name x and the rest will be bound to the name ys. But also an additional um, constraint is applied that this list, the tail of uh, whatever is passed in, uh, should also uh, have substructures, should have at least one element. So overall, this pattern will never match if there is a list of uh, one or less uh, uh, elements in length. So uh, basically, the result of this is very simple. Um, you can also rewrite it like so. You can say, oh, it's a list where it has to match this pattern, where the first element of the list is x, second is y, and whatever is there in the end, the tail of it is, is bound to ZS. And so this is the uh, uh, a funky way of writing if statement in Haskell. So it's called guards, and uh, you could test for equality. And if x equals y, you invoke compress on uh, um, a newly uh, assembled list where you prepend to the tail y again, which uh, was not necessary in this case, where I already called it ys. But um, in the, uh, if it's otherwise, then we actually want to keep x, because it's, it's now a representative element. And then we invoke compress, do the, the same amount of work, and then prepend x uh, to the list that it produces. And if, if this uh, pattern fails, we go to compress and uh, uh, we return uh, this argument. So. Um, um, it's, it's quite a lot of new information, but you can go back to this solution later and, and try to decipher, because well, I, I spend a lot of work trying to make both solutions look as close as possible to each other so that you can read Python and uh, see uh, the line of flow in Haskell. So I've done some benchmarks. Uh, so the, the first one is the uh, Python solution. 
Uh, the second one is the Python solution, but running in PyPy. And uh, uh, then we've got uh, the second Python solution, the one that did not use group by, but not a recursive one, the one that used the generator. And I compare PyPy here and uh, C Python on my um, laptop. Uh, it's B and um, desktop is A. So uh, what you see here is a comparable performance on the desktop of PyPy and C Python, but uh, uh, here the um, PyPy is a lot faster, as you can see, than C Python for the uh, uh, generator implementation. So, and I've done GHC versus PyPy, where the the first solution in Haskell with uh, uh, group by and second without group by with pattern matching uh, is uh, competing against the uh, PyPy. Uh, first and second Python solutions. So um, uh, on my desktop, uh, it was pretty close. Uh, and uh, on the laptop, it took a bit longer. So uh, these Haskell solutions and these are Python ones. So um, please uh, go and benchmark the solutions yourself because uh, it's uh, what I figured out is very uh, dependent on the uh, platform. Yeah, please. So uh, it's yeah. Actually, if you if you open the solutions, uh, this actually is just a, a viewport into the file, and below there is the actual benchmark. So you can you can have a look yourself. Uh, uh, I think the lists are sufficiently large uh, for it to be meaningful. non-JIT version. Okay, um, uh, I think the one that I used was uh, mentioned earlier in the slides. You could, you could go back and try and install it and, and verify those results. So I think we're into coffee break now, is this right? Okay, so we still have some time. Excellent. So, so we are moving quite fast and uh, this is great because I got lots of material. So the next task is to try and flatten the list in Python. So um, but there is a, a small constraint. If you, the list that you, uh, uh, this function called flatten uh, accepts, it should be preserved. And this is a set of uh, uh, assertions. I think you can find it uh, as uh, 99 under something under flatten uh, problem.py in problems directory. Um, at the moment, uh, it's up to you. So, you, uh, whichever you prefer, uh, uh, anything uh, what feels natural to you in Python. The only requirements are satisfy the test and please have a non-destructive rec recursive solution. Okay, sorry. Uh, this particular one, I think the, the extra. Let me restate the extra constraint is please use a recursive solution. Uh, that should be non-destructive as well. So L, you, you invoke flatten on L, where L is a list, and if you use L later on, it should be the same as the one you've passed into flatten. So uh, L is still available, because you can potentially come up with a solution that destroys L as you work through the elements in L. So, oh, thank you. Yes, yes. Uh, probably, yeah. So non uh, uh, non destructive recursive solution. This is uh, 99 under something flatten. It's called uh, 07 flatten problem. No, I didn't. This time, uh, it's all yours. Sorry?
if it's only depth of one, you don't need. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but that's the point. I mean, uh, there is a uh, uh, the problem is defined as a set of assertions. So as long as assertions are satisfied, I'm happy. So uh, you can you can yeah. So the the all the constraints are there in the form of assertions. Нет, у нас справа. Загрозит? Хорошо, да? Да, мы ну, мувим какой-то бит. Я поставил на 6 половин. Поэтому... Хорошо? Супер. Тут-то. Okay, let me, let me show you. What is the solutions? Because it's a, this is solutions. It's yeah. an import benchmark, but I don't see any benchmark. Everything is just. Uh, Hold on. So if you go to which which particular problem you want to look like, at? Like, like not the eight, this one, the solution. Mm -hmm. Because you have, you, I see here. Yeah. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. With this you import benchmarks, but I don't see duplicate like benchmark like this. You import from there, but I don't see the model. I see. Fine. I forgot on this file. Very good point. I'll upload it in a second. Okay. So duplicates benchmark. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what yeah, I, I pattern matched on file names and yeah. So uh, yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll probably put in a line for now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Any interactive version of ASCO like Python? Yeah. The reason. Uh, yeah. Google it. There is a uh, uh, ASCO version online. Yeah. Well, it's fine. I have access. I think uh, it's just. I, I. I think for now it's non-essential. I'll make all the files available online. I'll make all the files available online. So, yeah. It's just. Yeah. I was in a hurry. Yeah. Right. So uh, while we are working here, uh, uh, there was a question. 
um, about the implementation of compress where I checked for the null list. So I, I must have uh, written it, because uh, uh, I was writing, I was morphing it. So you're right, the, you don't actually need to check, test for nullness. So the, uh, it becomes a one-liner, like this one. And the, yeah, and the, um, the other um, question was um, where, how, uh, how to correctly parse these expressions. So I, I've written uh, five versions of that one-liner so that uh, you can get the idea of how space dollar and parentheses interact. And functional composition. So these are all equally valid uh, ways of writing uh, the solution. Yeah? Yeah, you need to uh, uh, pull it down from Hakic. Uh, I think if you have Cabal installed, or for Debian, it's packaged as a separate uh, uh, Debian package. So if you up the cache, so up get. Um, um, then, then you will need to work out how to install it for your platform, uh, or run it. But it's called the uh, it's called H unit. It, yeah, it's the same as Java uh, uh, test uh, unit framework, or uh, it, it's uh, very similar to Py unit or unit test in Python. Yeah, it, uh, it's available as the um, package in the latest version of Ubuntu, uh, the precise point Golin. Um, but you could also, if you have Cabal installed, you could uh, do Cabal um, list and then uh, type it in. It will tell you the package name, and then you could do Cabal install that package name, and uh, you will get it this way. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay, sure. There you go. It's the file that you were looking for. Yeah. I'll upload it to the Python website. It's, uh, you can probably type it faster than <laughs> I upload it. So. Um, just for everybody's uh, uh, interest, uh, the, uh, I've forgotten to upload one file on the USB stick. It's, it's really a toy test. If, if your Python files fail, just uh, create a file like this, or uh, um, you could probably just comment those lines out. There was some commonality been, uh, uh, among the benchmarks that I was doing, so I factored it out in a separate file. So. Some 
some Python, no, this is some Python files, uh, the ones that I showed benchmarks for, they actually depend on this module, the uh, toil module. It's not essential for the, the course, but uh, someone was looking for it, so I put it up here. Yeah, something like that. Um, good question. Try seeing uh, Google for it. So, uh, how are we doing? Um, a few people start uh, looking bored, so I'll continue. How many people have uh, done it already? Yeah, majority, moving on. So, this is a solution, again, a generator one, very similar to what I wrote before. It's, it's quite nice and short and succinct in, uh, uh, if, if implemented through recursion, I think. So uh, next, uh, please modify uh, your solution uh, to a non-destructive, non-recursive version. Uh, non-destructive means that the argument, uh, uh, basically I want uh, the uh, flatten function to be a pure function. Uh, ex uh, depend only on this argument, and also that argument I want to be uh, untouched. Pardon? Sorry? Sure, but um, the, the point is the L, which is available in autoscope, if I do at the end assert L equals whatever I... Uh, yeah, sure. If, if if you want to do that, you can. Well, a pure a pure function is defined as a function that uh, depends only on its arguments. So that's that's the definition I work with. But um, you you can copy it inside, and uh, you can worry about efficiency. Uh, I, I I make no statements about that. So the recursive solution is this. So um, um, what it does, uh, Flatten G is a generator, and it's, it's very similar to the previous solution uh, for uh, um, compress recursive solution. So what it does, it checks first if L is a list. And if it's not a list, it just yields the constituent, which is this element. And if it is a list, it iterates over uh, the uh, constituents of L, and uh, it invokes recursively Flatten G again on every item, and uh, it yields that item. So it, it's, it's the most compact way I could represent this using the recursive uh, um, uh, frame of mind. Yeah? Does, does this Just a sec. Yeah? Yeah. Here, uh, this, this only like cases where you have just list and list, but what if I have list and list and list? Does it also have two pass? Because these tests don't, don't have these. But what, what, what is intended? Uh, I think it, it has to be a, a list of lists potentially, and you have to flatten it. But what if it's a list of list of lists, or even even more deep? Well, it's 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 handle here. Is it this one? Yes, but yeah. it's not not recursive. I mean, it's impossible to handle it if the nesting can be infinite. Why is it not impossible? How, how, how do you do it if it's uh, infinite nested with a for loop? 
Oh, this is a Tusk. Yeah, of course. Because these tests don't yeah, sure. It. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So, it's, it's easy, it's yeah, of course. Easy yeah. To, so, uh, an addendum here. Um, um, there was a, a note that the uh, tests are actually uh, incomplete for this example. So, uh, what they don't test, they don't test uh, for uh, um, the possibility of uh, uh, infinite nestness of those lists. So, uh, that is the intent. intent so, flatten. Uh, um, and so this is a possibility, but I don't test it in assertions. But please uh, add an assertion yourself if you if you want. So what is the next exercise? The next exercise is uh, um, restate the same um, non-destructive but non-recursive way. Yeah. Let let me write an assertion, extra assertion, uh, and see if if it's supposed to work. On this. So, um, this is yeah. so it's full confusion. Yeah, so uh, this is the nested list example for the uh, for the uh, recursive non-destructive solution. I've added this extra assertion uh, that tests for the possibility of uh, uh, three deep nesting for a list, and it passes it. So uh, just augment the, the the test set with this one, please. And, uh, That solution I, I don't want to show yet. So, so now the tests come from non recursive solution which supports the multiple. Uh, Correct. This, this was always the intent. Uh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten about this extra test case. But, um, yeah, so um, what I've added here, I've added the, uh, the extra assertion which is missing in your versions. Use anything you want as long as you don't invoke this function recursively. That's a constraint. And uh, uh, it should be non-destructive as well.
I will be doing. But have you have you started working on the uh, non-recursive, uh, uh, non-destructive one? Cool, good stuff. Good. <laughs> it's destruction. So, so, yeah, so when you are in the uh, interpreter, what it puts you by default in this weird thing called I.O. monad. Uh, and so um, in the monad, we need to, uh, all the definitions have to be uh, preceded by let space. Um, yeah, so monads are uh, very special deeds, and uh, uh, I, I, I wouldn't have time today to talk about them. But the, uh, I, I mean, there's if Monads are very special beasts, they are for interacting with the outside world. When you are in monad, you have to precede it with uh, let space in, in the monad. So the, uh, if you, you want to make a definition in the monad, it has to be let space. And when you fire up the interpreter, you are in the I.O. monad. Um, in, 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 yes. Yeah, so uh, do you have an interpreter? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, uh, you, so you cannot just no. So you need to say let. Yeah. Oh, so you type because I type on the project. So let x equals one, and then yeah, then you, you see yeah exactly. Just until you understand monads, okay. when you are in the monad, please prepend it with let space. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's as, as much as I can offer in this this, this course. Yeah. I think it went to sleep. Maybe. What's going on? Uh, we lost the. Uh, do you know what's going on? Okay. Did it work? Or yes. I think it's about for you. Cool. I think we're having some projector issue here at the moment, so uh, you get extra time <laughs> to polish it. <laughs> oh, it's warming up, excellent. So, but why did it why did it go to sleep mode or?
Right. Oh, cool. Thank you very much. So, uh, Uh, yeah, non-destructive, non-recursive still. I, it's, it's quite a difficult exercise, so there's a bit more time that I allotted. It's subjective. Uh, it took me longer to write the, um, the non-recursive one than recursive one. So I, I'm giving a bit more time on this one. Cool stuff. So... Um, <laughs> Well, uh, you've got the problems, so uh, you could uh, always uh, come back to it, right? So, uh, so uh, I hope you uh, uh, got the uh, uh, some way towards solving this one. Uh, I use the stack to solve it, and uh, that's my solution. It's uh, uh, a bit longer than the non-recursive one, and uh, uh, I'll, I'll just quickly walk through it. So, I've defined a uh, helper function which I had to uh, um, cryptically name RSC, so it fits on the screen, and uh, it returns a reversed uh, shell copy of a list that you pipe in, and I used it in two places in the actual flut and g function, which is a generator. The first thing it does, it takes, uh, it creates a, uh, a stack uh, uh, list, and then it puts uh, the shell copy into it. Then it uh, uh, consumes the stack, and uh, if uh, the, uh, it pops the head uh, from the stack, and then if uh, it is an instance of a list, it does some work. Otherwise, it just returns the head because it's, a, it's a, a, an element. And if it is uh, not an element, if it's, uh, it has some structure to it, if it's a list, then we check uh, if it's not an empty list. And if it's not an empty list, then we uh, uh, create a head head. Uh, we pop a uh, head, and then... Uh, we append the head back onto the list because it might contain more elements. And then we check if the head head is itself a list. And if it isn't, we yield head head. Otherwise, we check if it's a list. And if it's a list, we put it back on the stack. So uh, it's, it was a, a lot more work uh, for me to write this. And uh, if, if you've got shorter versions, please send them to me and I'll publish them on the uh, Cool, yeah, so uh, please do. Uh, yeah, cool. So, uh, so mm -hmm. well, uh, the constraint that I had is that the, uh, um, I wanted to uh, uh, use list in the most efficient way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but the, um, um, yeah, um, please do send me the solutions and I'll, I'll discuss them. Uh, on the um, uh, to my email address. Uh, I think uh, Python website now has a search function, so you you could uh, Google my name and uh, it'll, you can send me an email. So yeah. Yeah, it's a shallow uh, reverse copy. Yeah. So um, next is uh, a destructive non-recursive solution. Um, so you're allowed to destroy the list. So uh, it's a, it should be a simpler version still, because now we we are allowed to destroy the um, the argument. And it's again non-recursive. So uh, you can reuse some of the earlier work you've done. Uh, sorry, um, I was at the same time uh, reading the message. <laughs> so, Can you uh, write some code and then easily run it from the Python? So, uh, Can you run Haskell module from the Python? Um, talk to me about this later. Yeah. So, uh, we are over time, okay. under time. Yeah, yeah, minus 15, which means? Uh, until the break. Oh, yes, we are over course. the break. Sorry? So minus 15 means I'm 15 minutes over time? No, uh, no, no. Okay. Still Excellent. Okay. So minus 15 minutes left, apparently. 
Sure, sure. I'm, I'm teasing you. The difference is you're allowed to uh, destroy L. It's previously a kid. Yeah, so if, if you wish, if that's the uh, that's how you uh, read into it. Yeah, what, what I wanted to do, I wanted to pop the list from the end um, when I was doing it. And uh, um, um, if you destroy, if you consume the list, right? If you keep consuming it from the front, right? If you use that pattern in the previous exercise, then it'll be an expensive uh, operation. So, but uh, you you probably have very different solution from mine. So. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Not full copies, shell copies. So if there's substructure, uh, yeah, good. If, if, you, if you go back one slide, uh, yeah. Um, so basically, you're using yield, yeah. Probably to to, avoid, uh, to uh, lessen the memory consumption. But at the same time, up there, I just wanted to copy of the entire list anyway. So uh, the yield doesn't add, add in any extra performance. I'm making a shallow copy, so not the whole copy. Yes, I know. Yeah. But then, even then, yield doesn't make any sense anymore. It doesn't pr add any efficiency, it just makes it more complex. Mm. Um, mm, perhaps. You're, you're probably right. Uh, I mean, this is the A solution, this is not the solution. So um, I, am, um, I, I would really like to see some of your solutions on, on the side so we can all discuss them, let's say, uh, part of the fun. What is a shallow software? Uh, basically, it, uh, it, it's, uh, I, I think, it's so, sort of uh, self-explanatory. It, it takes, uh, uh, you can have a deep copy where it copies all the lists, um, but shell copy just copies the uh, references to lists. I, I didn't show destructive version yet. Okay, so uh, you can consume the list and uh, it will not be available anymore in the outer scope. I'm making a copy, so I'm. Shallow copy, shallow copy makes only a copy of the list, but not of the list. Yeah, so uh, everywhere when I pop it back, I, I've used the, the RSC function in two places. So I, I, yeah, I always put a shallow copy back. That's why I factored it out in a separate function so it fits on the screen. But um, sorry, there was another question. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think it's removed uh, in the. Uh, if you if you go to solution three dot pi, it should should not be there. Uh, but well, I, I left the editing version of. Pi. Okay, so please do remove that constraint. I mean, now uh, it, it, as you can see, it's not on the screen. It, there used to be a. Uh, Yeah. Correct. So um, um, 
that's what I came up with again uh, up to uh, uh, wear and tear uh, if you have uh, a better solution but uh, I use the same solution I just uh, did not make a copy I uh, kept consuming the, the list that provided uh, as a first argument So uh, it's uh, uh, in the folder, so you could have a look at it. Why don't you just, uh, why don't you just iterate over the stack? Oh, because you want to you want to destroy it. Okay. Yeah. So um, what I wanted to communicate, if uh, uh, to restate the obvious, is that the uh, uh, for me the um, functional uh, um, recursive way was the shortest and the easiest to write. And then the one that uh, I wanted to preserve a copy of uh, was a bit harder to write. And th this one was the easiest, uh, probably because we Im imperatively mined it. And uh, that's the preferred way in, of solving it in Python. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's also in the solutions folder. I think it's uh, solution3.py with appropriate prefix. So, um, the same set of, uh, so those who didn't finish it uh, could continue, and those who are interested in Haskell side of things. Uh, I'll briefly mention the differences. So first of all, Haskell lists are obviously uh, homogeneous lists, so you can't actually have a, a list of lists that can have elements in them as well. So we had to define a, a data structure, uh, and there is this data keyword in Haskell that can help you to do that. So. Uh, a uh, nested list is uh, uh, parameterized by type variable A, and it has two constructors, the LM constructor, which stands for element, uh, or a list of nested lists. So that's the thing that I had to define to actually solve this problem. And the, uh, the set of tests looks very similar, except we uh, have this uh, slightly uh, verbose way of writing a nested list that comes uh, free with the strong typing. Um, so the solution that I have for it is um, um, this uh, two-liner. So um, again, I use pattern matching here. So if the first argument matches the uh, uh, this pattern, which it has to be an element, um, then I bind the uh, contents of it to uh, the um, uh, variable x and return a list containing that element. Otherwise, it has to match list x because there are no other constructors in this definition. And then what I do, I recursively invoke flatten with the, uh, const the uh, whatever x is bound to, which will be of type list of, uh, um, with elements of type nested list a. And then there is this uh, uh, funky tool uh, in uh, uh, Haskell called concatmap, which basically works as, as follows. If you have a... Uh, a, a list you want to map over and potentially the function that you apply to every element can return uh, instead of uh, a scalar, uh, a vector if you will uh, um, so a list in itself it gathers all the lists uh, in one big list and flattens it putting all the values together so it's like a map with concatenation afterwards um, so that, that's a Haskell solution uh, an equivalent one to the first solution that we've seen in Python and then uh, you can also avoid using concatmap, which is sort of uh, uh, written by someone else for you. So you can test for the, uh, now for three cases, you can test for uh, uh, an empty list or an element, or this is where the, the meat basically of this function is. You um, bind x and xx to the constituents of uh, the nested, uh, of a list containing nested lists, so x. Uh, will probably be either a element or a list. And then um, what you will do, you will um, add the um, uh, result of invoking flatten function on the uh, remainder of the uh, list constructor, or you will, um, and then you uh, concatenate the result with flattening the first element. So it's, it's, it's a function that calls recursively itself twice. Um, so this is no, no 
a group buy or no concat map solution and uh, that's uh, it for Haskell side of things so please uh, 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 if you have time later uh, play around with these solutions and see the performance and uh, readability of them so the next uh, task is run length encoding so you it's defined by this uh, again set of assertions so but the idea is uh, uh, verbally is that uh, uh, you want to compress the list uh, with identical elements uh, into a list containing tuples where the first element of a tuple uh, states how many times the element should be repeated and the second one uh, contains the uh, exemplar of an element so that you can then decompress it later so and uh, uh, I just want any solution at this time uh, uh, whichever you fancy Which ones? Yeah. It's the first one, the one that does not contain any uh, suffix. Uh -huh. okay. so we will, uh, look at, at all of them, yeah, one by one. Okay. So this one is the easiest one. So uh, uh, should be a one-liner. No restrictions, correct. What are you doing? Have you found it? Uh, which one? This one? It's uh, run length including problem. Yeah. This one. Yeah. It's slow internet. <laughs> yep, that's the one on the screen. Yep. It just counts the number of items. Yep, correct. It's a form of compression. сказати їм, щоб вони порталися. А котрі години сказати, щоб поверталися? Ну, по-моєму, нормально. Нагнали час. А котрі? 45 хвилин є. Так? Time. Yes. Right. So um, we have a coffee break now. The solution is uh, uh, this one that I used. Um, maybe you come up with a different one. 
but it's uh, uh, essentially again utilizing the power of group by from iter tools. You unpack the key group iteratively, and then I uh, pipe the group this time into a pack function, and pack function does the work. So uh, after coffee, uh, which I think we are supposed to reconvene here at 17:15, uh, we'll continue with run length encoding. Thank you. Pardon? Yeah. We're using tuple values. We're using list, and uh, you have a key uh, available already. So taking L zero doesn't make any sense. You can just return uh, len list group and key. Yeah. Instead so I I used tuple this time because um, I, I don't know, I don't need the functionality of uh, the possibility of multiple elements. So um, for correspondence between Haskell code and Python, whereas in Haskell I use the tuple to solve this exercise and wanted to keep them in as a... Yes, but you're using tuple instead of list when you have pack tuple group. Yeah, that's what I want. You're converting group, basically group is a, is a sequence, not a fixed uh, length uh, thing. Okay. Tuple is, tuple is not meant for, for that. Yeah, thing. sure, but uh, you can convert generator into a tuple, right? Yes, but you should convert it into a list. Mm -hmm. So why would you prefer the use of list there instead of a... Because tuples are not read, read only lists. Tuples are tuples. It's a different. Tuples are not read-only lists. Technically they are, but semantically they are not supposed to be used as read-only lists. Because it's semantically wrong. It, it makes the code less readable. Okay, so... Because group and that will have a dynamic number of items. So you have a lot of items. It's not semantically correct in Python. I see, I see your point, yeah. And, so and again, pack is unnecessary because you can just create the tuple inline and instead of using yeah, L0, yeah, you ju just use, use key. That's very good point. So I'll... I'll so it just becomes like this. Yeah. yeah. So this is the, the, the easiest and, and, and the most readable solution. That's the same as this one, except it's, it's more yeah. readable. So, yeah, so um, can you refactor it so it has a pack function in it? Because it will be important for... But not, not, in, uh, not nested. Uh, yeah, but that's that there, there's yeah. no yeah. pack function. You get the you get the first element. You don't need the pack. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So well, basically uh, you are clone the starting the solution. Yeah. Just take the starting yeah. solution yeah. and clone the list first. I mean again, the, the pack is not that's, uh, if, if there is no meaningful it's just meaningful it's not meaningful to use pack because pack uh, returns a, a two tuple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here I, I already get the uh, the grouper here, so Mac would only have to uh, would, you, would only have to return this. Yeah. So um, where do you get the number of elements from? I get them. Length yes, right exactly. Place. So what uh, what I want I want to work out the length in the and the uh, representative element in another function. Yeah, but why? Oh, because it'll it'll make sense later for the uh, other exercises. You mean like this? Uh, so pack items. Um, so, but I want uh, the return of pack to be a tuple. But why? Because um, that's that's how the exercise is structured. There will be in the series there will be three exercises that are related. And but this makes no sense. I mean, it, it's it's completely confusing. So why is it confusing? Because, I want because you have you have key there, and you you make you're building the key again in pack. Even sure, you have it sure, already. sure. You can pass, you can make pack the function of two arguments if you if you want if it's readily available. So, you, you mean, so you, mean, you mean like this? Yeah, correct. And then uh, all I want I want the packing operation to be a separate function. Yeah. Like this. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's an alternative solution. Uh, uh, I I take your point. It's not very optimized, and uh, I'm I'm only using this to illustrate a point later. Yes, but this is not about being optimized. It's just confusing code. So it's difficult to understand this if I don't know why it's necessary, and you know. Sure. Um, well, well, we will talk about it later. Um, it will make sense, I hope, in when we solve the second and third. So, but uh, I will rephrase this a little bit differently now that I uh, talk to you. Hmm. Or, or as, as you pointed out, I could pass it to pack function. Yeah, because it's already available. And uh, what I'm doing at the moment, I'm making it inside the pack function again. But um, 
uh, I think what, what I try to do, I try to make correspondence between Haskell and code and Python code one to one almost, so that uh, people who don't speak Haskell can understand it and vice versa. Uh, that I'm going to go and disagree with you there because the uh, Haskell solution uh, uses tuples because I can have a homogeneous list of tuples and uh, tuples uh, um, they are of length 2 so uh, they are of length 2 it's, it's a list of tuples of length 2 but the proof are not of length 2 yeah sure but um, um, the proof is uh, not of length 2 exactly. why is that well, n, n, or in that particular case, n equals 2. No. No, it doesn't. No, yeah, I, sorry, I'm not talking... Sorry, we are talking about different tuples. I'm talking about this tuple. Yes, but this is okay, but the tuple in this, this comprehension is wrong. Sure. So, I, I understood your point, and uh, um, what we can do... Uh, apply. Is this the one? Sorry. Can, what's the name of the file? So. Uh, uh, ten uh, problem. Uh, so what you want? Um, uh, what basically? Yeah. And you can use a next instead. No, Key. Okay. That's okay. This is just Hold on. Yeah. So um, mm, let me rewrite it. The pack. Key. Yes, please, have, uh, they are, I, they're the same, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so key, and then we get uh, the group. Yeah, hold on. If you have a real group by enough scale, you can just use this instrumentation it translates into ASCII for it in natively. Yeah, so, but... No, can you use the list comprehension? Well, we'll, we'll see how it's solution. Have you looked at it already? Mm -hmm. So, um, let me rewrite it uh, with uh, the point that he made. So, so what we want now here is for, for completeness, I would want key here. Yes. And, and this there. You have to do this because group is an iterator. Yeah, so, um, how... List of, uh, line of list. Of next? Or? No, you do len list group. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay. Um. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that's what I wanted to, to have. So, um, your question? Question? Yes. It looks very well that you, you need to talk, uh, talk in Haskell because Haskell does have this component and you don't need to use the map. Yeah, of course. I, I, I use list comprehensive a lot. It's just that uh, for it felt like when I wrote this course that there will be a lot of new syntax introduced. So and you know, everybody in Python already knows list comprehensions. So and they are in Haskell obviously. So I avoided them altogether. <laughs> so yeah. So I, I wanted to learn uh, you to learn something else. Because um, list comprehensions were borrowed from Haskell into Python, right? So, and you, you know how to use them. I think we're supposed to reconvene here at uh, 17.15. So can you do a deep list? Can you do deep list compression in Haskell? Can the early, can a later uh, variable refer to an earlier variable when you do a list compression? Later variable refer to? Like, like for x in y for, uh, like can you do a, can you do like Python, we can do for x in for red in white, for white in uh, I think if you... In Python, yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, it's, a, it's a Dvorak layout, so I have to warn you. <laughs> so, if, if you write it here, I guess it would be better. Or on, on the board or whatever. Sorry, I'm just going to write this down. Uh, so that I don't... Yeah. You can do if you want to do flatten, you can use uh, X, you can do flatten L, but yep. uh, it comes for uh, SL in L, or X in L. What is SL in L? Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. In L. Yeah, yeah, cool, yeah. If L is a parameter, and this is a shallow flatten of the... Uh, so if I, I'm sorry, I can't quite read that. Uh, I'm going to uh, type in... Yeah. For SL in L, 
x4 sl in l yeah for x in sl and it is the shallow flatten of l yeah yeah it's can you like this uh, nasty um so um probably Yes, of course you can do this in Haskell. So um, uh, Haskell um, list comprehensions are actually more powerful than uh, Python ones. They allow you to do ifs in the middle, not only at the end. Python allows you to do if at mm, the end. Mm. So uh, I think uh, I would refer you to the uh, one page on uh, Haskell list comprehension here. I think the syntax is slightly different, but they are more powerful than the. Uh, so so they, have, they allow you to do ifs in the middle. I think. No, they don't. Like yeah, Python, if you want to do an yeah. if, yeah. you must do it, put it here yeah, yeah. at the end. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Naskill, you can put the if at the middle, <laughs> I think. Cool, yeah. So, um, mm, it'll be something like f uh, predicate x for x in the cell. Is that, yeah. So, um, mm, there is an equivalent way of writing it in uh, note one. But this is on Python. Yeah. I think. Uh, cool, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love these comprehensions. I love them very much. So, um, so we have coffee and then come back. <laughs> okay. All right. Well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 